Um, but kind of here's our lay of the land so people know what's coming uh, over the course of this webinar here. Doing some brief housekeeping and introductions and stuff now. Um, and then we're going to follow that up with kind of the, we've reordered it, but it's a, a why, who, what, how, and where. Um, but kind of looking at just the, the bigger picture of what's going on. We want to make sure that there's some time for questions. Um, we've heard from a few people that they have some questions, and so we're hoping that uh, we'll, we'll get to those. You have the ability to um, submit your questions uh, via the, the Zoom app here, and so definitely feel free to send those in. We're going to be watching for those and have some time at the end to address those. If for some reason you're watching this later um, and it's not live, uh, definitely feel free to, to reach out. We've got the Ag community as part of the APGA um, online web portal that we can engage in and use that for a conversation point. Um, if you also don't feel comfortable with that right now, um, feel free that if there's a person here in this webinar that you want to follow up with to, to learn more, I know that all of these presenters would be happy to engage, answer questions, um, and hear from you with your questions. And so, um, you know, definitely use this kind of agenda as your return point if you want to talk with people about kind of what's going on for things. Um, so one, uh, if we'll progress maybe to the to the next slide, um, kind of looking at, uh, yep, thank you, Tara. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll pause there. So, oh, wait, sorry. Big, no, that's fine. Big picture is welcome. Uh, this is a topic that I think many public gardens are starting to think more and more about. If you're not sure what a crop wild relative is or maybe where your garden fits into the conversation, we're hoping that this today will help, uh, you know, help excite you and maybe those of uh, those that are you're working with in your garden to really start thinking about this topic. Um, we think it's an important topic that public gardens can play a role in uh, in the coming years. And so um, really this is a sort of an engaging, excited uh, conversation kickoff point. So with that, I am gonna tur turn it over to Tara Moreau um, and from UBC. And so Tara, if you wanna kick it off next with, uh, with your portion. Okay, that sounds great. Let me just see, here we go. Um, so thank you everyone for tuning in and for those that might watch it later, I think I just wanted to reiterate uh, that this is a conversation that we've been having and this is a lot of the work being done by the American Public Garden Association Food and Agriculture Community uh, and trying to explore and raise the profile of the Tampa Garden uh, and connecting uh, our work to food security. Um, and, and making that direct connection, I think I might just pause, mute you, Devin. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Great. Um, and making that direct connection to conservation. And I think it's really important as we explore this about the why do we do this work and why is it relevant? And I, I know for all of us in botanical gardens, we work uh, in a shared goal of trying to conserve and think about uh, plant extinction. And um, we've seen that this accelerating species extinction and, and losses to biodiversity can really uh, and significantly threaten our, our planetary boundaries as well as our food systems. Uh, and in the context of the Anthropocene, we are seeing increasingly the climate is changing. And so how do we, uh, for those of us that are interested in preserving and protecting plants, how do we prioritize? And I think when we think about agriculture as a sector, uh, there's a lot of work that shows that agriculture is a really unique sector. It is both uh, uh, a con it contributes to, to biodiversity loss and species extinction as well. It can be a significant player in, in trying to support conservation as a whole. And so this is a slide by Alison Miller, and I think it's really important because, you know, we, we have to see that conservation matters for agriculture uh, and that we can use plant biodiversity to improve and think about future agriculture uh, not only for today's generations, but for, for future generations. Uh, and that we can also be thinking about our agricultural systems and how they can uh, be changing in the future to, to be providing a real asset to conservation and to ecosystem services. So this is a bit about the American Public Garden Association food and agriculture community. We work within this area of wanting to increase food literacy and how we have gardens helping to do that. Um, 
So I think there's some really interesting areas already underway. Uh, the Global Crop Trust does amazing work in this area, as well as the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization. This has uh, put out a really great report. It's not a short document. It's about 600 pages. Uh, but the state of the world's biodiversity for food and agriculture is a really um, great resource for understanding how biodiversity in, in our food and agriculture systems, uh, the services that it provides, some of the issues that it's facing, and I think really can position that biodiversity uh, in food and agriculture systems can be a great tool for both mitigating and um, adapting to climate change. So I, I just want to tell a little story about how a lot of we sort of embarked in this road. There was an incredible book written by Gary Paul Nabhan, Where Our Food Comes From. And I think this, uh, a few of us read this and shared this three or four years ago. And to me, this was a really interesting perspective of how our global, where our food plants come from and how do we be understanding uh, the genetics and food domestication and for botanical gardens, exploring uh, our living collections as plant genetic resources. Uh, Colin Corey, who's one of our speakers uh, today, he's one of the key authors behind this map, which I think has been an incredible resource to raise the profile of where food comes from. It's the primary origins uh, of diversity of our agricultural crops. And, and so this uh, embarked us on this, on this interest in how can botanical gardens um, get more involved in thinking about the plant genetic resources of our food and agricultural systems. And simultaneously, um, we've been doing a lot of work in thinking about the UN Sustainable Development Goals. For those of you that are not familiar, these were adopted in 2015, and they provide a global framework for how we can uh, work as a global society towards sustainable development. They're a strategic plan with targets that takes us to 2030. And I think there's a lot that food, that botanical gardens can be doing to align to the global goals. Um, but in this context of this discussion that we're exploring crop wild relatives, uh, I think it's the most relevant is target 2.5, which is maintain the genetic diversity in food production. And this is a really interesting target in particular because most of the UN Sustainable Development Goals targets take us to 2030. This is one of the few targets that has been prioritized to achieve by 2020. And I think that just speaks to the urgency and the importance of plant uh, genetic diversity for food and agriculture. Uh, so if there's, if you're interested in learning more about that, that definitely suggests the UN Sustainable Development Goals website. Uh, and Ari is going to talk next about more of these collaborations and some of the publications that came out of this. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Ari Novi, do you, can you hear us, Ari? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Awesome. And then this, this, this is Abby. Abby. I want to interrupt really quickly. If you turn your video on yourself on your computer, the video will so, oh, okay. So, if you, okay. Well, I might mute you, Abby, just while we get going. Okay, Ari, I don't know if you can turn your video on. You want me to video? Do I have to? You don't have to. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> I, I, hi, everybody. Um, I'm just going to really quickly talk about um, who's here, and I'm going to try to use some of these bells and whistles thing. Uh, let's see if I can make it work, right? Like, like I want to acknowledge, here's Casey. Is that working? Can you guys see that? No, I don't think so. Oh, yeah. oh, I see it. Oh, you do? Okay, okay. Oh, I love it. <laughs> right. Nice, sorry. Maybe I can make it bigger. Yeah. Hey, Casey. <laughs> There's Casey. It's hard. This is very small. But I want to acknowledge Casey. I want to acknowledge Tara. So, you know, many years ago now, Tara and I um, kind of petitioned Casey at APGA to create this food and agriculture at what at the time was called a section and is now called a community. And we had right from the very beginning an idea of wanting to convene a special meeting um, that, that would really start to dig at um, this intersection between food, um, public gardens and agricultural research. So, you know, this, this was a, a long time dream um, and I think it's really amazing that it actually happened and there's really 
you know, really every single person in this picture, as well as probably another 50 or 100 people that aren't in this picture, um, deserve a lot of credit for helping make this happen. And so I'm just really grateful that it did happen. But in a, in a nutshell, what, what happened was um, we started the community with, you know, with the idea of trying to really understand um, what, you know, what was really the the breadth that which public gardens wanted to engage in the topic of food and agriculture. And, you know, it was everything from, you know, community, you know, vegetable gardening and, you know, educational programs for kids on how to grow food and teach about nutrition to these, you know, concepts of this complicated relationship between plant biodiversity in general and agriculture and crop biodiversity um, and, and, and all that stuff. And so we really wanted to take one of the more complicated themes um, and, and expound upon it. Um, as well as create a little bit of a, of a, of a channel um, through which to communicate across our two disciplines of agricultural research and public, public gardens. Um, and just, you know, I didn't put a slide for this, but, um, you know, for those who follow some of the UN stuff, there was a really interesting call in the UN Conference for Cities, which was in Buenos Aires, I think in 2015, um, that really noted that with the urbanization of people, that we had lost sort of informational connectivity as well as product connectivity um, between rural areas producing agricultural production, you know, agricultural goods and the urban consumers. And so I think we also saw this as very much a way to connect you know, an, an urban education audience that botanic gardens and public gardens have access to, to um, the sort of, you know, sort of sort of cloistered and, and rural um, agricultural research world um, which of course, you know, these people, we all need to talk to each other more. So what, what, what happened was um, uh, really the APGA staff, Casey and Sarah Beck and others helped identify a funding opportunity. And we wrote a grant to, to um, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, which we got um, to do it, to do a special conference. And we also raised a little bit of money through some other sources as well. And that allowed APGA to really say, okay, we're going to, we're going to support this and, and really try to make the, this this symposium happen. Um, in the process, we brought in um, what's called Access, um, th th which is the um, three different um, societies: the American Agro uh, American American Society of Agronomy, Soil Science Society of America, and Crop Science Society of America, um, kind of worked together, and and they served as a, as a co um, PI on, on on that grant. So this was all kind of put together. Um, you know, with, with that group of people. And I'll just qu maybe quickly mention some of our core team, uh, Allison Miller, Colin Corey, uh, Jeff uh, uh, Cuny, um, Sarah, Sarah Beck, um, Elizabeth, whose name I can't, whose last name I can't remember from, from Access, um, uh, myself, myself, Tara, Sharada Krishnan, and who am I forgetting? I think that's Elizabeth it. Bullman was her name, I think. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so that that was the really core group that that spent almost almost two years meeting to kind of make this thing a reality. And uh, next slide, please. Um, I I just want to sort of echo what Tara had said a little bit earlier. Who's controlling slides? I am. I'm sorry, it's coming. Okay. Thank you. okay. Oh, I got to get rid of this thing now. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, and uh, you know, th this is another way of uh, another slide. This is from the Q State of the World Plants Report in 2000, and I think it was 18, 17 or 18. Um, that um, that really talks about all of the causes of, of biodiversity loss, plant biodiversity loss worldwide, and all of that blue on the right that makes up slightly more than half really is what we would think of as agriculture. That top right quadrant is is sort of you know cropping and livestock. And on the bottom right is, is logging, which is another, you know, forestry, which is another form of agriculture. So I think it's really important to recognize that agriculture, as Tara said, is simultaneously the largest um, driver of plant biodiversity loss worldwide, and it always has been, um, or at least, or at least has been for an incredibly long time. Um, but also, we need to eat, um, and um, biodiversity is critical for sustainable agriculture. So it's a really kind of kind of paradoxical top topic and and we chose p the the way to do this based on kind of this reality of the paradox of needing agriculture but it also being kind of negative from a biodiversity perspective but but can be more positive uh, next slide please 
so for those hopefully who were there, this was the registration site from APGA. So we, we named the, 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 the symposium Celebrating Craft Diversity Symposium. Um, and, and the subtitle was Connecting Agriculture, Public Gardens and Science. So we, we really wanted to recognize that, that this is a big tent kind of a thing. Um, and so you, you can sort of see we had all these organizations that were supporting this, all these societies, um, as well as the World Food Prize Foundation, um, and the, the US Department of Agriculture. Um, and there was really broad recognition that this is a fertile area to be working in. Um, and it was ex so exciting to bring all of these people together. We had about 150 people come to the symposium in Des Moines. Um, we had amazing representation you know, from all over the country. We had, I think, eight different federal agencies, you know, a ton of gardens, uh, you know, many, many different land grant universities. We had even industry was present. Our field trips were great. We went to um, the various um, um, germplasm research resource centers that are in the area, as well as visited uh, Corteva, which is which is essentially what was Pioneer Hybrid, um, and, and sort of learned about how industries, you know, working with with crop diversity, and, and we really had a, a, a wonderful um, experience there. And um, next slide, please. My last oh, too, too much slide again. Um, so I, I want to acknowledge that the the, the the engagement was really deep. Um, so we actually published proceedings from the from the from the conference, and so these are 13 peer-reviewed papers that were published in a special issue of Crop Science, um, and you know this is um, really outstanding, um, and and you know it shows that you know not only were people there, and not only did people come to the meeting, but that they 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 brought their research with them, and they used the opportunity to to publish you know original research articles in topics as diverse uh, as you know educating to germplasm management to um with, you know the, the the roadmap for conservation use and public engagement around crop wild relatives for north america was, was published here this is a tr pretty tremendous um amount of engagement and, and i think we're very very proud of them so all these people listed here as authors were involved in in, in no small way uh next slide and I just, for those who really want to learn more, um, the CSA News, which is the, the sort of newsletter, um, monthly newsletter for the um, Crop Society, Science Society of America, Soil Science Society of America, and American Society of Agronomy, wrote an article um, about the symposium, um, and, um, and it made the cover of their December 2019 issue, and that's, that, that's available on the web, so if you just sort of Google CSA News, Conserving Crop Diversity, this will pop right out and give you even more information. Um, and so that's that's sort of all I have on the who. It was a lot of people, but really the PGA and the Crop Science Society folks. Thank you. Great. Um, I'm just going to jump in here. This was uh, Colin. Can you hear me? Are you okay to take on and and do the next few slides? Yeah, I'm here and ready. Oh, awesome. Okay, I'm going to pass it over to you. All right. I'm going to try out. Okay. I tried out the video, but it looks like um, it looks like it might not be working. So, um, so hello, I'm Colin. Uh, I I suppose that I'm one of the folks that was pulled into this collaboration that was mentioned more from the agricultural research sector, and it's been a real honor and pleasure to work with the botanic garden sector uh, over the last couple of years. I've learned a huge amount, um, uh, among other things, about how to communicate with the wider public. Um, so thanks so much for that. And uh, so what I'm hoping to do in, in just a couple of minutes is tell you about one part of our collaboration, which is, uh, which is developing out shared priorities and, and writing them out and publishing them uh, between our two sectors, let's say, and then, and then including also other groups like land managers uh, around North America. The, this work didn't come out of a complete vacuum. As was mentioned, there is a lot of that higher level um, uh, writing about food security and, and the future, et cetera. But uh, let's say at a, a little bit more of, a, um, of a, an applied level, we'd been writing uh, articles about the conservation status of these sort of plants for a while and, and building up the evidence, um, mostly to figure out who they are and where they live and, and what their conservation status is right now. Tara, if you don't mind uh, forwarding. And uh, if you can go one more actually. And so I'm not sure actually in, in the webinar if we've given a little bit more of a description of what these plants are. Uh, 
So if you'll allow me very quickly, these are plants that are, uh, that are interesting for at least two reasons. One of them, they're interesting for agriculture because they're genetic resources. That is, uh, even though they're wild plants, they can be used in plant breeding to improve crops. And uh, there's four examples here that are all native US uh, plants, native crop wild relatives. That is, they're the ancestors or the cousins of existing crops like sunflowers or uh, hazelnuts or corn in the bottom left. And all of these four examples have actually been used by plant breeders to bring in uh, traits of interest for, um, for farmers, ultimately for consumers, if you wish. The other side of the equation that makes them interesting is that they're, they're wild plants. And so they're, uh, they, they're, they're subject to all the issues that wild plants are subject to um, in terms of being potentially threatened by human activities, climate change, invasive species, et cetera, et cetera. And so they're at this you know, fabulously interesting, complicated intersection. And so we've been interested in figuring out their conservation and um, also communicating about them and improving their conservation, et cetera. If you don't mind going uh, one more forward, Tara. So uh, some of the work that I've been doing, just as an example of what <laughs> we're trying to do to, to, to understand them, is, is building up information that in part comes from botanic gardens or particularly from the herbaria contained within botanic gardens uh, to map out where the species have been collected before, like this example of a wild uh, squash from, uh, the, from the southwest, from the deserts. All those blue points you see there are records that come from herbaria essentially and, and also from gene banks like here where I work in Colorado. And then building models which are basically mathematical models based on those points plus uh, similarities in climate or soil to get a good guesstimate of where we think the species occurs which is what that uh, peach or yellow um, color is. Uh, from there, then we can start to do conservation planning. If you don't mind uh, forwarding just one more forward, please. So uh, I think that over those two years that we collaborated, if you can uh, just go a little bit for further forward, Tara, thanks. Over those two years that we collaborated, one of the, the tasks that I think that we recognize is that we needed to figure out exactly where our overlaps were between the communities. And, and so we developed out five big overlapping interests and, and they're huge, they're meant to be inclusive and that many folks could get behind. And when I say we, uh, it was a very broad uh, list of stakeholders, not only from botanic gardens and agricultural research, but also land managers and others who contributed to this. and 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 hopefully can say have bought into this broad uh, set of five priorities. The first priority is really a, a more of a science-y priority, let's say a, a, um, a knowledge generation through science priority. It's about really continuing the, the sort of work that I've been more involved with, which is trying to understand who these interesting species are in North America and uh, figure out what their conservation status is now. Building on that, uh, there's the second priority, which is about habitat conservation for these species, and therefore necessarily involving the land managers and other folks who have open spaces um, to let them know about these species and, and, and garner their interests. The third one is really about ex situ conservation, both in botanic gardens and in uh, seed banks, like where I work here, making sure these species are, are conserved for the long term. The fourth one is recognition that these species, if they're really gonna be used more in agriculture to contribute to food security, et cetera, uh, they need work. They need to be uh, bred or at least need to be uh, characterized and evaluated to figure out what their specific traits are that might be useful. Things like cold tolerance or salt tolerance, et cetera. And then fifth and certainly not the least was the recognition that there's so much to do in terms of public education and awareness around these plants that few people know about, um, most people treat as weeds if they know about them at all, um, and yet uh, have some part to play probably in our future food security. If you don't mind just going one more forward, Tara. This is a fun photo that, uh, that we had taken during one of our planning meetings in Arizona about a year ago when folks were getting together to hash out the roadmap and then also to take a look at existing activities that we wanted to build on. In this case, in Southern Arizona, we have one of the few dedicated reserves for a crop wild relative. It's on public lands, on national forest land, and it's for a wild chili pepper. And so we got to go down there and, and uh, see that species and uh, ooh and ah over it. I think that's all I have to say. Thanks so much. Happy to answer questions later.
Great. And Allison, how are you feeling? I'm, I'm doing well. Thank you, Tara. This is really fun. I feel like um, it's a reunion of old friends to get back and revisit these important concepts. Um, so I'll go ahead and talk a bit about the how of it. And I'm here representing, um, in part, the Missouri Botanical Garden, which I've had a, a long-standing affiliation uh, with over the past 20 years. Um, but I'm also here as a biology professor and a researcher um, at St. Louis University and the Danforth Plant Science Center here in St. Louis, Missouri. So I thought I'd talk about one of my favorite uh, crops and crop groups of crop wild relatives, uh, grapes, as an example, and uh, perhaps as a vehicle through which we can think about how we might go about enacting um, the roadmap for these crop wild relatives that Colin laid out. So. I think grapes are a terrific example. Um, they, they're a group of 60 or so species, the most common one or most well-known one of which is the wine grape, which is actually native to Europe. Um, Colin mentioned a number of, of traits that wild, uh, crop wild relatives carry that are often the target of breeding programs um, for salt tolerance or heat, heat tolerance or particular flavor profiles. But in grapevines and many perennial crops, there's actually a, a, an expanded range of, of uses of crop wild relatives. So just as an example, I'll put up this um, picture of a grafted grapevine in which um, the vine is actually a fusion between two separate genetically distinct entities. And you can see they kind of uh, grow together at that bulb in between the scion, the above ground part, of the plant and the rootstock, the below ground part of the plant. Uh, most of the grapevines in the world are grafted in this way, but I bring it up to highlight the importance of crop wild relatives in both the above ground part of this union and the below ground. So if we look first at the below ground, the rootstock, there are three native North American species listed here in the genus Vitus, which are really critical for the, gra the global grape crop. They provide resistance to an, an aphid, a root chewing aphid um, that European vines are unable to withstand. So actually most of the wine grapes in the world are grafted to these crop wild relatives. And those relatives are, are actually relatively poorly known, not to make a bad pun. We're still learning about them and, and certainly not um, in any targeted conservation program. The other application of crop wild relatives in grape is in the above ground part of the plant in the scion. So I, I mentioned that the European grapevine is the source of most of our wine and that's true. Certainly uh, things like Chardonnay or, or Pinot Grigio or Merlot or whatever, those are, are, are cultivated varieties of a European grapevine. But here in the Midwestern United States and the Eastern and Southeastern United States where viticulture grape growing is um, undergoing somewhat of a renaissance, um, those native grapevines are critical for locally adapted disease resistant tolerant, disease resistant hybrid cultivars that can be used in places that the traditional European varieties cannot be used. So there's a whole nother list of other North American wild grapevine species on the far right here. Uh, which are used in many hybrid cultivars, including the major ones grown uh, here in Missouri. So I guess I, I wanted to just expand the concept of the application of crop wild relatives um, using grapes as an example. So prioritize, that's the first, um, that's kind of the first bullet point of the roadmap. And one of the things we're thinking about is how to prioritize which species uh, we focus conservation efforts on in North America and then how do we go about documenting and assessing their threats and thinking about the, the gaps in our current understanding of, of conservation planning. And Colin and, and his colleagues and many others have done a really terrific job advancing just how we think about the geographic distributions and conservation planning of some of these important species. Okay, so Tara, if you could get to the next slide here. Um, this is a, a picture of, a, of an Ozark forest here about two and a half hours from St. Louis. And one of the things I'm becoming increasingly interested in is uh, local efforts 
to identify and um, know and then conserve crop wild relatives within our region. So we're focusing on grapevines for a whole host of reasons, but one of them is that they, they literally grow in our backyard. And I've been thinking about how botanical gardens, if we could use this network of botanical gardens and have each, of, each garden focused at least in part on local crop wild relatives um, in their particular area, um, we could really make a, a pretty major impact on what we know about these taxa and hopefully on their conservation. So in this particular uh, picture, I think there are three or four native grapevine species, including one in the very front of the picture that's kind of a crawler uh, that we're here documenting. We found this, these populations through herbarium records at the Missouri Botanical Garden. And we're currently in the process of actually sequencing uh, the genomes about, of about five individuals in this photo. Okay, next, please. All right, so that, that last picture kind of focused on the protecting in the wild, the, um, the in situ conservation efforts that I would love to see expand in, in crops and their wild relatives. But then there is also the other side of it, the, the ex situ conservation, the backup collections, which are conserved in, um, in existing um, collections. This is an example of the US Department of Agriculture's um, grapevine collection in Geneva, New York. Now there's a terrific seed bank, a series of seed banks that are holding um, seeds of crop wild relatives and other species, which we'll hear about in a bit. And that's a, a hugely important um, point of collaboration for backup. But for perennial woody, for long-lived um, crops and crop wild relatives like grapevines, um, one of the ways that people conserve these are actually in living collections. And so through our partnership with the USDA, um, we've been able to back up some of these and our collaborators have been able to back up some of these wild populations in living collections. There's a huge grapevine collection in upstate New York. There's a second even bigger one in, uh, in California near Davis. And I just wanna emphasize how really important those backup collections of living material are in my opinion, they're under-resourced at this point and under-appreciated. Um, so in addition to serving as a backup, those USDA collections, and there's others you know, based at universities or even in private collections, in addition to serving as a backup, they're really the, the repository uh, from which scientists like me and many others can access that material for uh, research and also for education. So our collaborator here on the top right, Jason Londo, who is a USDA grapevine geneticist, has helped us secure material for various experiments over the years. Um, it's just been a tremendous resource. And I, I see a lot of potential for the linkage between the botanical garden, um, just the knowledge of the distributions of the plants and the capacity to make local collections um, I see a lot of potential to connect that type of work with the concert, the longer term conservation, even living conservation programs at the USDA uh, and elsewhere. Okay, I think I just have one other si slide. So the the roadmap was to prioritize uh, to prioritize these these plants to protect them in the wild to generate a backup to make the, the, the diversity accessible, but then also to build capacity and raise public awareness of their value. And for this, I think botanical gardens are, are just critical. Um, so we benefit from our, our close proximity to the Missouri Botanical Garden. It's a, a garden that draws in about a million visitors a year. And one of the things that we've been doing is piggybacking on a very popular event at the Botanical Garden called Grapes in the Garden. They sell 1,500 tickets for this every year. People come and try out different wines uh, throughout the garden. That's the picture I've shown in the bottom left there. Um, but we have gone and set up a table with our grafted grapevines, with native grapevines, with herbarium specimens, and talked people's ears off and it was interesting. They got a little bit more chatty and questions seemed to emerge through the night after people had made a loop through the, uh, the grapes in the garden. But we, we interacted with a number of different visitors and were able to just talk about the basic biology of grapevines and the role of North American vines in, in the grapes that they were, uh, were enjoying. We also have some, some display vineyards at the Botanical Garden as well. So it's this, this is the kind of the how that we um, in, 
might be able to implement the roadmap and with this last point focusing on on that public awareness day. So I think I probably over talked about grapes as usual, but I'd be happy to take any questions and um, I'm excited to continue this, this conversation. Awesome. Thank you, Allison. Um, before we get to Abby, Devin, do you want to just talk real briefly about our Crop Wild Relative Week? Okay. Yeah, I had to unmute there. Uh, yeah, so kind of looking at one of the ways last year we were, I think we talked with several gardens that said, so what can we start doing now as part of this? And um, I think recognizing that a lot of people that we engage with in the, in the garden world, visitors, just aren't even really sure what a crop wild relative is. And I think a lot of gardens haven't talked about this topic yet. And so we just said, you know what, let's, let's use the already existing crop wild relative week, uh, which is celebrated each fall uh, in September and the, the dates there, September 22nd through 29th. Um, and really trying to say, hey, you know, we can help tell this story. Let's start with a, with a social media outreach. Um, and so if you might've seen some emails coming out uh, last fall, uh, sharing out some resources of images and various things that um, gardens could post to their social media to participate in the Crop World Relative Week. And a number did across uh, across the country, both on Twitter and Facebook and such, using the the hashtag of Crop World Relatives, trying to link it into the bigger conversation um, that was happen that's starting to happen on social media. And so it's coming up again this year. Um, and the, I know that the, the gardens are planning on trying to participate again. And so if you're interested in that, um, you know, you can kind of keep your eyes peeled or reach out to any of us as we're getting closer to, uh, to that in the fall. Great. Thank you, Devin. And our last panelist is, is Abby. Are you, can you hear me, Abby? I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Great. Thanks, Tara. And thank you, everybody, for, um, for joining this webinar and all the previous presenters. It is a really great group of, of folks and I've enjoyed um, observing and, and pitching in where I can in this effort. And um, the perspective I would like to provide today is not going to be new um, in this meeting even, this particular, what's been said already. Um, so it will be no surprise, but um, hopefully this, this will be you know, a valuable global perspective as well in thinking about the network across the botanic garden community as well as the the crop gene bank community this is a uh, global map of botanic gardens of over 3600 um, gardens or similar institutions that we have documented in bg in bgci's plant um, sorry garden search database and um I realized I didn't quite introduce myself, but I'm with Botanic Gardens Conservation International and I head up the US branch. Um, and I'm based in Southern California. <clears throat> and this global network of Botanic Gardens is what we try to leverage and um, facilitate into sort of a rational system for plant conservation worldwide. And food plants and crops, crop wild relatives are all valuable for plant genetic resources. And um, so this is a great uh, subset of species that, that gardens are already preserving as well. Um, next slide, please. And just really quickly wanted to touch upon um, the fact that botanic gardens are really a perfect setting as Allison alluded to, the perfect setting for meeting conservation goals. Um, they have the expertise in uh, conservation, both in the wild and ex situ, as well as education and outreach, the horticultural know-how and the information that they gather about growing plants, as well as the science and research that's, that's conducted in various ways um, through gardens. And they also have world-class facilities that uh, support all of that work. And <clears throat> I, well, I'll just mention um, at this juncture that um, we estimate there's over 60,000 uh, trained horticulturists, for example, at botanic gardens around the world. And so there's a whole army of, of um, folks that are, are qualified 
and poised to be leveraged for for conservation goals. And crop wild relatives is a great a great um, group to focus on um, in this way. Next slide, please. I'm trying to remember the. Okay, can you go back? Sorry, I wanted to also mention that um, botanic gardens because well, some of their strengths include not only their, um, their technical expertise, but also the fact that as, as several folks have mentioned that um, we, we are great at outreach and educating the public and visitors. And we reach, we're estimating over half a billion uh, visitors and students and tour groups uh, each year worldwide. And that's quite a quite a mouth um, a mouthpiece or or audience that people are that gardens across the world are meeting, and so we have a powerful voice um, to to change public perceptions and to to shape um, to shape understanding of uh, topics of concern, including uh, food security. Um, we also through our collections in botanical gardens. This is my last point here is that uh, we are documenting through BGCI's plant search database um, over a third of plant species, of known plant species are in botanic garden collections um, currently. And that's uh, over 100,000 species worldwide. So that's quite a, in terms of capacity in, in maintaining plant species diversity, it's, uh, it's great. So let's move on to the next slide, please. Um, I was fortunate enough to last year um, participate in the, the Crop Science Special Edition and submit a study that I was able to do in partnership with the U.S. Botanic Garden on uh, botanic garden holdings of crop wild relatives. And one of the lists, um, one of the groups of crop wild relatives that we looked at were a priority, priority um, North American native crop wild relatives. And we used that checklist to compare with Botanic Garden Holdings in Plant Search. And we found of the over 200 taxa that are US priority, we found 175, so a, a good majority of, of taxa in botanic garden collections. Next slide, please. And we also found that those 175 taxa were maintained at gardens all over the world. 170 within the US in institutions um, and then over 250 institutions outside of the US were holding these priority species um, from the US. So it's really important to think of um, the Botanic Garden community as sort of a dynamic and supportive global community that, that can help preserve species all over the world. Next slide, please. And just uh, finally, we'll point out looking at these uh, U.S. priority crop wild relatives, um, we looked at the holdings reported in crop gene banks versus the seed and plant collections reported by botanic gardens and then combined them and you can see the synergistic effect of uh, you know the a potential collaboration between these two sectors um, and I think that's what that's where I'll end I'll just say one one more note that I'm really thrilled this year to be partnering with Colin Curry to um, develop a, a workshop around a crop wild relative group in the US and we're, we're planning to bring together some botanic garden stakeholders as well as crop, crop gene bank partners to talk about a specific plant group and um, identify some actions that can be shared across the two communities. So hoping to emulate exactly what, we're hope, what we've been thinking about doing for so long. So um, I'm happy that this is coming to fruition at least in a small way for one one crop wild relative group. <laughs> so thank you all. Thank you, Abby. That's great.
Um, and so we're, we're getting close to the end. I think one of the things that uh, you can have a, a, a great plan and now we as, as uh, participants in this larger roadmap and, and collaborators from different sectors, you know, we, our next steps are really thinking about how to act and implement this plan. Um, and so I think we were sort of being open about it is a bit unclear right now how we're going to be implementing this plan, but trying to uh, bring together stakeholders and others uh, and currently with with this roadmap with these five goal areas, I think what we're struggling with is do we embark on trying to achieve them all or do we break them up into their respective goal areas. And so that's just a bit of where we're he our head is at and um, but we we wanted to share uh, especially with the botanical garden community where we're at and knowing that there's so many great ideas and knowledge holders within this community. Um, so I think for this we have, we don't have as much time as we had originally wanted, but we have about 10 minutes left uh, for questions or ideas. Uh, and so I think, um, Tommy, I think people can be putting their hand up. Is that correct? How do we best support the questions or ideas or from from the audience. Uh, yes, this is Tommy. Uh, yeah, you can put your hand up or you can use the question and answer box, which is should be at the bottom of your screen if you'd prefer to just type out your question. I have not seen any questions come in so far. I see um, Duran, did he raise his hand? Is that a hand raise or is that just a high five? Uh, I believe that is a hand raised, so I will allow Duran to talk if he would like to ask his question. Oh, okay. I didn't know whether or not I was, okay. It's, it was, it's, I was on mute. Um, hi. Um, this is all very amazing. Um, I'm curious as to how do we uh, engage with intentionality uh, 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 to engage with indigenous communities around uh, conversations uh, related to food ways and food sovereignty. Um, I, I, I believe that uh, this, I, 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 we raised the same question at the uh, symposium uh, and I'm curious as to how as a body do we engage with uh, indigenous communities uh, in, in, in relationship to uh, this work, and particularly in the, in, in the United States, uh, in the Southwest, uh, or even uh, uh, further West, um, as it pertains to uh, identifying uh, their indigenous food ways and how they relate to these crop wild re relatives. Duran, that is such a great question. Uh, and it's so nice to hear your voice and thank you for raising that. And I think that was definitely some of the feedback in part of what we talked about in Des Moines uh, about a gap and, and an incredible opportunity for us in this roadmap moving forward. Um, I will say that when we were developing the roadmap, we had uh, put together a survey to get as broad a participation as possible. So we had shared the roadmap uh, with different Indigenous leaders one of the conversations that Sarah Beck and I have been uh, having is uh, finding uh, leadership uh, and, and aligning and, and building those relationships. Um, I can't necessarily you know, speak to the US, but in Canada, uh, I think uh, my approach here at the University of British Columbia has been all about relationship building. And so I think that is where I see us having to start. Uh, but I think kind of to Allison's point earlier that the botanical gardens, we can sort of in our own local areas be tapping in and taking leadership on identifying local crop wild relatives, I think that's also an important step for us to consider how do botanical gardens in their particular areas uh, build relationships with indigenous uh, communities. Um, so I think that's a huge opportunity and, and I would you know, welcome other ideas of how we can move that forward in a really meaningful way because I think it's really important.
So what if we, do we have, um, let me just see here in terms of, Duran, do you have other, do you want to, do you want to share, do you, do you have ideas there um, that you, or suggestions being, being um, from the U.S. that, that might be a way for us to explore that perhaps we haven't been thinking about? Um, well, yeah, so, um, I, I mean, I have some, I have some, I have some ideas, uh, some, uh, that, that, could serve as models uh, or a model. Uh, I know that um, one of the issues that has to be surmounted is just the legacy of botanical gardens in general. Um, you know, to be candid, you know, we know that botanical gardens have uh, a certain je ne sais quoi that is connected to colonialization and, you know, uh, extraction from uh, uh, indigenous communities. Uh, so one of those, uh, I guess, dialogues that, that could be important is, you know, I mean, this is not divorced from the, from the conversation of botanical gardens having to work towards deeper levels of inclusivity uh, in their uh, leadership, as well as in their staffs. Um, and, and, and in this frame, uh, it, I think it'll be even more important to really, you know, be rooted in that in that work of equity uh, and helping to foster equity through community participatory re research. Uh, so it's not a one way kind of thing where you know the the botanical gardens in their respective areas are pulling data and knowledge from these indigenous communities and then it lives. Uh, somewhere else uh, or it's utilized somewhere else other than uh, in the communities that are, are in question. Um, so I guess uh, one of the things that I think is uh, of paramount importance is really, really thinking about how this work can integrate into the, uh, into the IDEA committee uh, and their work of, of deepening inclusivity uh, across and equity work across uh, botanical gardens that are in APGA, um, and, you know that that that's that's a very soul searching work for each in institution that aspires to do this work is like whether or not they're ready to really center uh, indigenous communities and decenter uh, their own white leadership. Uh, predominantly white leadership. I mean, I don't want to be presumptuous, but uh, just decentering uh, or decolonizing even uh, what it means to be a botanical garden and how they engage with those communities and in the ways in which they uh, engage with those communities. Um, I think there was a there's a form there's a forum thread somewhere on the APGA on the publicgarden.org website about decolonization of um, botanical gardens and how it's not a metaphor that this is a real active work uh, that can be done. Uh, whether we're talking about uh, native seed keepers, uh, folks that are resurrecting those indigenous foodways in their respective uh, regions. Um, I, I, I hesitate to speak on our work because we have not been as deliberate in engaging indigenous communities. Uh, we've been more focused on uh, just engaging hyper-local communities specifically, which typically have been looking like uh, non-white communities. But I think the principles of uh, working with communities instead of doing for, uh, uh, creating community conversations that de-academic, you know, just, 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 just kind of brings this stuff down to earth and takes it out of an academic exercise for communities in question will be a really relevant exercise for all of us to think about how do we, you know, like it was said earlier, how do we make this stuff accessible for, you know, the everyday man or woman who lives on the reservation or may or, or, or may be desirous of uh, resurrecting those indigenous foodways uh, for, uh, for their communities. Can I well, just jump in for one second, Tara? Mm -hmm. this, this is Alice, and I just appreciate this conversation so much, and I'm trying to envision from a botanical garden perspective, like what would be the best first step to take in that direction? And 
I'm like, I'm kind of thinking, would it be to hire a locally focused person whose job description is to um, kind of, as, as you, I'm paraphrasing, but as you say, kind of get out of the usual business of botanical gardens and start looking at kind of more non-traditional uses, <laughs> non-traditional species on, on a super local basis, be it with Native Americans or just neighborhoods mm. um, within uh, within the community. I, the Missouri Botanical Garden is based in the city of St. Louis and I lived a half a block from the garden for 10 years and I was surprised how few of the people in that neighborhood had any idea what was going on at the garden and mm -hmm. vice versa. Right. And I wonder how, like, how do you, that gap seems like it should be bridgeable, but it, at least I haven't seen it. I think it could be done to a greater extent than what I've seen so far. So I guess my long-winded question is, what would be your first best step to take? Well, I'll, I'll just, so for us at, at Lewis Ginter, like our, our work uh, iterated, you know, around developing kind of uh, centering our work around collaboratives with other stakeholders that were expressing desire to address uh, sustainability issues, uh, uh, lack of food access issues, environmental justice issues, um, cultural uh, issues, and even racial justice issues uh, in, our, in our region. Um, it did start with, a, it, it, it started with kind of like convening those groups and building that collaborative. So, you know, looking at, um, you know, models for collaborative impact, uh, 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 collaborations for collective impact as a as an incubator space would I would say step be step one but then uh, evolving past that like definitely a hire trying to hire identifying uh, uh, community members who are rooted in in their in the fabric of their geographic areas and you know are doing th this type of work or similar I mean I, explicitly around food sovereignty work I think that is probably the most uh, relevant topic uh, for uh, indigenous communities as it relates to this conversation. So, you know, a, a second area may be, you know, indigenous food ways. Uh, yeah, but but uh, hiring someone that can put that that can put teeth uh, to, you know, a community engagement strategy by uh, either. Uh, you know, I'd be hesitant to say uh, APGA as a, 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 APGA as a as a as a as a as a macro body, but I think that each uh, botanical garden that's participating in this work is going to have to, you know, identify uh, very hyper local uh, conditions uh, to uh, spearhead that work. You know, the collaborations are going to be on the ground uh, for the most part, and then also. Uh, the people that they can identify are going to be right within their spheres of influence and connecting those people. Uh, it's a full body exercise. It's, 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 it's definitely not it, 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 from what I, from what I can imagine, like this could be a gateway into deeper levels of inclusivity in botanical gardens and in, in people's respective areas. But the body that is expressing the desire to do this work is going to have to be ready for a wider panorama of conversation around, you know, uh, the legacy of the botanical garden in this area, you know, what kind of programming does the uh, institution do, uh, whether or not it's accessible for the folks in those communities to engage internally, but then also how are they sharing resources in communities external to their physical location. So, um, that's it's a deep. That's a deep work. I mean, again, it's it, it requires some soul searching, but I think that um, you know, if folks aspire to do this work from from a very sincere place, you know, building those collaborations and then doing a doing a hire from within their communities will be it, it won't it won't be difficult uh, to yeah. do. Well, and, and, you know, I, you know, I think I, I'm sad that we don't have more time for discussion and we're kind of three minutes over, uh, but I'm glad that the discussion that we are having is centered on this. And Duran, I think what, there's a really unique opportunity right now as we're trying to figure out how we go from a roadmap to a 
sort of bringing and growing this uh, and making this happen, I think as a bridge, uh, an opportunity for APGA, that's a really great idea. So thank you uh, to all of uh, our speakers and our attendees. Uh, appreciate you showing up today and spending some time with us uh, and for your question, Duran. If you have other questions or you wanted to clarify things or be involved in this moving forward, you're welcome to send me, this is Tara Moreau, an email. I'm available. You can find my contact through the uh, APGA uh, website or any of the other speakers I'm sure would be happy to clarify. So thank you all for coming today. And Tommy, thank you for helping to organize the logistics and Sierra also for helping to organize this event and hope you all have a great day and uh, will engage with us as we move forward.